Welcome to Our Town, a 30-minute podcast brought to you by Best Bark Communications, a small but fierce client-centered marketing company powered by decades of experience and well-established business networks. This is Andy Ockershaus, and this is Our Town, and we have a very, very special guest that we're going to talk to about his life and the life of our town and what he has done to make it good, bad, and ugly. He covers it all. A brilliant, award-winning writer, author, and media strategist. And his specialties have been the D.C. government, crime, and the local media. And Harry, there's so much crime in local media, I don't know where to begin. Sometimes I I cover them all at the same time. (laughs) They all work. There's not a lot of crime in local media, but there's a lot of people with steel ratings. Well, a lot of people think the local media is criminal. (laughs) <laughs> so some of it is yeah. we know that but harry it is so great that we have a chance to talk to you about the harry jaffe none of us know because we all know you as a writer we all know you as, as a local celebrity and a and a great friend but what about harry where did you grow up harry i'm a philly boy so uh, and i and i can't escape that um and i you know i and i wish that i could root for the washington nationals but i, I don't like them yeah, because I'm a Phillies fan, so I, I carry it with me, even though I left home at 17 and never went back to live. Um, Did you go I, to school in Philly? I High went school? to school at, actually, uh, my claim to fame is that my sister, who's 10 years older than I am, went to school in Over, at Overbrook with Wilt Chamberlain. My claim to fame wow. is that I went to Lower Marion High School, where Kobe Bryant would eventually go. So uh, right. I, I went to school in elementary school in, in Philly, and then uh, we moved to Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, and I went to junior high and high there. Never heard. Well, well wasn't Kobe's father from Pennsylvania? Is that why they ended yeah, up there? Absolutely. Yeah. They, they, yeah. He was a great basketball player, too. Right. Now, tell me about why would you leave for, for Montgomery County, Pennsylvania? Is that Bucks County? It is right uh, adjoining the western uh city line there's city li- there's li- literally city line avenue and then montgomery county so well, it's, it's the main line out there exactly right? exactly well, big bucks harry yeah i knew it yeah my parents you know they, they, we lived in a, in a small apartment uh and went to a very good high school that's i think that's why they well, how about your there. college uh dickinson college a small school in central pennsylvania is that fairly dickinson is that no different? it's just dickinson and uh I, I went there. Uh, I didn't even apply there. Uh, I, uh, I got into, uh, I, I was a lacrosse player in high school, and I was on a state champ- championship lacrosse team two years running. And uh, I was recruited by Dartmouth and wow. uh, Colgate and a couple of other schools. So I thought I was, I thought I was made in the shade. <laughs> so I wasn't a great student. Uh, so I applied to these schools. Didn't get into any of them. I got into USC. And I love the Trojans, so I wanted to go to California. My father said, nah, not going to California. He called a friend on the board of Dickinson College, which I'd never heard of, and that's where I went to college. That's that, how stuff worked. That's in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania? It's in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, just, uh, just, oh, south, Carlisle, of, I know. just south of Harrisburg. Well, that's where the Redskins train. We used to train. Now, now I know Dickinson know. College. Yeah. We always thought of that as Jim Thorpe School. Exactly. Well, it was, right? That's exactly right, yeah. The War, Carlisle, college, the, the war college is right there right. as well. Well, they were great years for the Redskins when they trained in Pennsylvania. They were world champions. They should have know? gone back. Those were the days. <laughs> they should huh? never have left Pennsylvania. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. So what about the lacrosse? You know, this is a hot blood, a hot area for lacrosse right. now because of Maryland and UVA. Absolutely. And then Towson now has come up. Are they in a different league? Johns Towson? Hopkins as well. Yeah. There's so much lacrosse here. Uh-huh. And I did not know that about Pennsylvania, but... Um, well, back in the you know in the in the old days when I played lacrosse, we played with um, wooden sticks <laughs> that really hurt when you hit somebody, and that was why I I love lacrosse is because it's the only sport where you can legally hit somebody with a stick, <laughs> and it's a good thing. And it hurts. It stings. Yeah, yeah. But it's so it's world class now. I mean, it's become a worldwide sport because of the schools like Dickinson, I would assume. Mm-hmm. So, Harry. What were you studying? How, you don't study to be a writer. No. You study, no. what do you study? What's, interesting, what, what, what's interesting about Dickinson College is that it is one of these kind of militantly 
uh, liberal arts schools, they will not teach you anything that has an ISM on the end. That is, that will try, that will actually get you a, a job. Like journalism is too uh, is too uh, close to actually, you know, employment. So at, at Dickinson <laughs> College, everything was, you know, creative writing and nonfiction writing and long form writing. And I didn't even take those classes. I came out of college, I could not type. Right, because we had we, we wrote in the in the in the blue books, and uh, but I was a, a decent photographer, uh, and photography is what got me into journalism. Wow! Yeah, I've heard it the other way. I've heard a lot of photographers that want to get into. I mean, I've, uh, journalism people that want to be photographers, but that's just something. I but Harry, it. Did, did that connect you to, to Washington from Montgomery College? I mean, Montgomery County. How did uh, you end up here? A very, very simple story. Um, I, I was a, my, my first time in Washington D.C. was in 1971 when I was arrested for the May Day uh, uh, <laughs> protests. Uh, I was arrested in Dupont Circle. You were uh, out of college at the time. I was a senior in, in college, and uh, uh, that's I, Vietnam. Then you were protesting. Take, I was taken to the to uh, the D.C. jail and uh, wound up suing the the federal government because it was an illegal arrest. And uh, about 10 years later, I got paid 1500 bucks in a settlement because we sued, you know, John it was a Mitchell. Class action class suit. action suit by Covington and Burling. At any rate, um, when I went to Vermont, uh, I was a, uh, a hippie. And, uh, I, but at a certain point, I needed to make a living. <laughs> and uh, because, Hippies have to eat, too. Uh, we, we do. And we did. And uh, so... Uh, I was known as a decent photographer, and the the, uh, the city editor at the Rutland Herald said, "Look, we 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 need a, a photographer on the weekends." And so uh, I walked into the Rutland Herald newsroom uh, in 1974, and it, it was like the hand of God came down and said, "Harry, you're home." Uh, I, I adored uh, being in that newsroom, and I learned how to type. I learned how to be a reporter, and. Uh, you know, pretty soon and I was Rutland's getting on the... a beautiful place to live. Eh, it's kind of a crappy small town, thank you, actually. It's, well, in, it a, it's, it's in a nice area. Killington is nearby. Rut Rutland, not so much. Um, so I covered Pat Leahy, who was the, the first-term senator from Vermont. He was a, a Watergate baby. He was elected in 1974. And uh, at a certain point in 1978, uh, I had been at the Herald long enough to think, this is enough of that. And uh, I applied for uh, a press secretary job with Pat Leahy. And uh, Leahy uh, hired me, and that's how I got to Washington, D.C. I came down as Patrick Leahy's press secretary. Came from, from well, well uh, Pat was from Burlington, I believe. Wasn't exactly. He? Well, I have dear friends up there. I'll tell you that story, but I'm, I'm not going to bore your listeners or my listeners with that. But uh, then, then how did that get you? To Washington, you came down with Pat as an administrative assistant. I was or his a, press secretary. I was his, his flack. flack. Thank right. you very much. I was his. <laughs> I was his flack, and and uh, I lasted a little bit less than a year, because I was not a flack. I was a hack, and I realized <laughs> that I, it just wasn't. It was not a good fit for me. So uh, I went back to uh, to journalism uh, in less after less than a year. I worked for State's News Service. Uh, which is a dearly departed small news service that covered uh, Washington, D.C. for small towns and small papers all over the country. Well, you know, that a lot of people have come up to the reading, I mean, the writing ranks, as you did, by working for politicians Absolutely. and then going into the business. Well, it's, it's, usually, it's usually the other way around. Usually it's, it's reporters who, get who, the job. who go to work as a flack or press secretaries, we used to say, um, I, I just could not stand being Patrick Leahy's mouthpiece. Uh, <laughs> when I wrote stuff, uh, f uh, an op-ed, and it was published under his yours. name, I wanted, I, you know, I wrote the damn thing. I wanted my byline, right. not his. So uh, that's why I couldn't, I couldn't last very long. Plus, well, he kept disappointing me. I love Patrick. He's a good, he's a good senator, but he did things that I thought were um, not up to snuff, and so I left. Well, but, well that, that led you then to spring out? Or, when did you work for the Post? I never actually worked for the Washington Post. I freelanced for the Washington Post quite a bit uh, it, across across various uh, sections. Uh, I wrote a lot for Outlook, and uh, uh, that or something called Post Watch. Uh, that was for Washingtonian. Oh, okay. oh, you watched the Post. Aha. Uh, that was that, that. That was a most read column 
in the magazine. I was told by the editors. Uh, Jack did, Limpert told me that was gold. They, they, did fo they, they did focus groups. And the thing about the Washington Post is that everybody back in those days in the in the uh, you know the 90s and early 2000s everybody got the post absolutely and everybody didn't like the post or a lot of people didn't like the post correct and but so, they all read it and so when i wrote about the grams or wrote about uh you know the editors uh, ben bradley and sally quinn and whatnot people ate it up so yeah it was a very it was a very uh, popular column well, and it had so much zing to it, Harry. I use that word because somebody told me about that. That um, it was all, it was inside, but it wasn't. It was, it was, you didn't get sued. You, you, you uh, held your uh, I, I tried. I tried to not be a, a media critic. I just told stories about the people what behind was going the bylines. There. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I gave. Uh, I, I made characters out of uh, out of the people like uh, you know like the writers who Sally Quinn it's not just Sally Quinn but Sally Jenkins who was the sports writer uh, <laughs> Tom Boswell the sports writer I would write about them and Tony Kornheiser Kornheiser hated me has he been on your show yet Oh no you got to get he Kornheiser but he, you know he he, feel, but he hates a lot of people so right. don't feel bad No I, I I it was a badge of honor for me <laughs> Probably well, the thing is and you know, when you were covering in Post Watch. It was a story about what was going on, like the uh, thing that they said, the feud they had with the radio station uh, in Northeast Washington. Um, what's her name? W O L, Kathy Hughes. W O L, right. and Kathy just took it on as a project, and it was a great thing for the Post. It got them out of their, you know, their upper Northwest attitude. Right. They it's tried. A, well, there was a Northeast, and there was a poor group over there. There still is. And it still is. And yeah. there probably will be somewhere. If it's not there, they'll move somewhere. But but I like the fact that you dug up. And they didn't dig. It was right there in front of everybody. Well, it, 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 reporters hate to be written about. So uh, they, they were both scared of me, uh, and also they realized that they had to somehow respond to me because I would write about them either way. Right, but it wasn't. It wasn't derogatory. You didn't make it up. It was what it was. Right. We had a fight. All with I have to say is with right. Ken Beatrice. <laughs> he tried to put Ken Beatrice away, and and made fun of him and belittled him. And I would say to George Solomon, his boss, right. George, Ken Beatrice is an actor. Right. So you guys take sports as the end of the world. Right. He doesn't. Kornheiser was in his own way a bully. Absolutely. And so with his he, column, he did not like to. But he did not like to be written about. Or bullied himself. Correct. So he could give it out, but he couldn't take couldn't it. Couldn't take it. But still a great newspaper. And and the Post today, I, it was that's not my favorite politically, but I I think it is. It was a great newspaper. I still read it every day. I think it's part of our life. It's part of our town. The Washington Post is so important. I believe. What's the? It's still, I grew up with the Star, right? Who was equally important because yeah. they were different. Yeah. And the Star went under. Yeah. We tried to save them, and the broadcast group tried to provide the money to keep a star alive. It didn't work. It, it, it bothers me to this day that there are not more strong media outlets in Washington, D.C. I think it's undemocratic. <laughs> I think you're I really do. right, Harry. Yeah. I think you need to have, uh, you have competitive uh, journalism, competitive media uh, to, to keep everybody else honest. Absolutely. Keep them honest. Well, Harry, uh, we're going to take a break from our town now and come back. We're going to talk about rest of the things that you have done in your writing career in our town. Appreciate that. This is Andy Ockershausen talking to Tommy Giacomo and bragging about his restaurant, The Palm. Hi, I'm Tommy Giacomo. Why don't you come down and see me at The Palm Restaurant? I've been there for 43 years. We have great steaks, great lobsters, great food. Caricatures on the wall. It's just a fun place to eat and drink. We're located at 19th and N, just below DuPont Circle. For reservations, call 202-293-9091. That's 202-293-9091. www.thepalm.com. Uh, this is Andy Ockershaus, and this is Our Town. We're talking to the eminent writer, um, and I say that eminent in all seriousness, um, Harry Jaffe, who's written for the Washington Post, the Washingtonian Magazine, the Washington Examiner. I don't know. You didn't write for the Star. I think they were probably gone when you got here. You know, I tried to get a job with the Star. They wouldn't hire me. That doesn't and make sense. if they had hired me, 
they might still be still around. be alive. And we had the money for them. But Harry, and you've written some great books about our city, and you follow the career, the illustrious career of the Barry family. I have. And there, there has never been a more polarizing figure in my experience in the city of Washington, Marion Barry, who was to some extent, he became a good friend of mine because he wanted to be. Sure. You know, I didn't reach out to Marion. We'd reach out to me. That's because WML was so strong. Marion played his smart politician. He knew how to play people. Absolutely. And he remembered everybody and he knew how to, he, he, he also honestly liked people. I know that. Um, you know, as opposed to somebody like Barack Obama, <laughs> who is who actually doesn't like people, right? He's a recluse. I think so. Marion like women particularly. Well, they're people. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, and and Marion would always count out to us because of WMAL, not to me, but you know, he, if Harden and Weaver had an event, Marion would show up. We had a benefit softball game between Channel Nine and WMAL Radio. Marion came and brought his little boy with him. A baby named Chris. Wow. Janice was there. I think Janice was the pitcher for our team. But Marion came out into the public. He got with the people. Absolutely. No, the the, the question that, that we asked in the introduction to our book, because I wrote it with Tom Sherwood. I, we were co-authors. Hi, Tom. And uh, the question we asked was, why do the people love him so? Because there are so many readers out there, most of them Caucasian, who, who, don't, who never got why... Marion could get elected anytime he wanted to. Uh, and that's what we tried to do in Dream City is explain how Washington, D.C. became uh, this polarized city, uh, this city that was what had, had limited home rule that really didn't control its political destiny because we're still under the thumb of Congress and the White House. Correct, and we had the control board. And, and so we tried to explain how Marion Barry came to power and stayed in power. That was our book. A great book. Well, we had a great character. I mean, come on, Marion Barry, <laughs> sex, drugs, corruption. I mean, you can't make that stuff up. So no, we didn't make anything up, but it was a riveting story uh, because, you know, he, he came up from uh, Itabena, Mississippi, where he was a son of a sharecropper and then he got a... Uh, but he was a brilliant student, I well, understand, he, correct? He, 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 he was chemistry. very close to getting a PhD in chemistry at Fisk University. Uh, then the uh, the Civil Rights Movement came, he became active in that, and then came to Washington and uh, moved up the ladder. Pride, Mary Treadwell. Absolutely. We covered him way back then. <clears throat> and Marion was smart enough to kiss up to the reporters who were there. A lot of people didn't cover him. They thought he was a flash in a pan with Mary Treadwell, right. but he wasn't. Not no in no way he was uh, he he is still kind of the the the, the grand uh, king of Washington D.C. politics. You may not like him, but he was mayor for 16 years. He was mayor for four terms, and he could have been on the city council representing Ward Forever. 8 until he until his face smashed into the dais at the city council. <laughs> but you know, the, there's so much to be said for Marion in his first part of his his tour. I would call it. He did a lot of great things for our city. I mean, that's documented by the progress that was made. And maybe it wasn't Mary, Marion alone. It certainly wasn't alone. But the builders went nuts when Marion got in. Well, there. he he, Marion Barry had a basic trade-off. It was he opened up the city for development. He opened up Pennsylvania Avenue for development. And his deal was, you can come and build, but you've got to pay pretty high commercial real estate taxes, so I can, you know, uh, have a lot of services for the for the for the city for the people who live here. And that that worked for quite a while. It did. Yeah. And he really tried to take care of people. I mean, I don't think Marion has ever been accused of stealing a dime. See, that's very interesting. You're exactly right. He he may have had a corrupt personal life, human frailties. But, you know, brown bags full of cash, that was not his thing. He, he was great. Well, we loved him. And he was very good to WMAL. And I appreciated that. Now, you're writing with, um, that was something you wrote with uh, Tom Sherwood. You wrote something with Chuck Conconi or a state or something that was in Washingtonian you did with Conconi about the city. Uh, Chuck and I collaborated on a few things. Absolutely. Right. And he's still active. Um you're doing a book, or you have done a book on uh, Christopher Barry. I am writing a an article right now for oh, Washingtonian Magazine uh, about the the recently deceased Christopher Barry, and and it's a sad story, obviously, uh, about a young man who people uh, who went to Wilson High with him used to call him the Prince 
because uh, Marion and Effie Barry's only child, uh, the expectation was that he would follow in his father's footsteps. And in a way, it's a, the tragedy was that Marion had expectations for his son, but did not nurture his boy. And uh, the, uh, the entire community, uh, African-American community, knew and loved Christopher, also knew that he had uh, serious drug problems and uh, never got him any help. They didn't save him. You know, you have to ask yourself, can anybody be saved? Well, uh, but there have been people that have been saved. You know, and, and also you have to put it in the perspective of the Kennedy kids, many of whom, you know, uh, were in the same situation, high That's expectations, it. you know, problems and with addiction. Um, and uh, so he's not alone, but this is a particularly sad story because it's a small community that and everybody knew from Cora Barry uh, to uh, everybody else that he ha was in trouble and nobody helped him. And that, that's so sad because he was a handsome guy. Handsome, well smart. Well-spoken. Handsome, smart. And he, I believe. Could have been a good politician. I think that he could have, be, he could have eclipsed his father. Is what I, wow. I truly believe. That's saying a lot, Harry. Yeah. So you must have known something. Yeah. Now that's the article you're doing for Washington. Correct. What else are you doing? Of well, you I didn't mention you did some work for Regardi at one time. Uh, that was a labor of love. I, I that, that's <laughs> how I began writing about Washington D.C. was was working for Regardi's magazine, and you know he, I distinguish myself from. 95% uh, of the journalists in Washington, D.C., because they are all here to cover the federal government, the diplomatic corps, uh, you know, the White House. Industrial Supreme complex. Court, all that. And I have always been interested and drawn to covering Washington, D.C., where we all live. And, it's our town, Harry. And that's why uh, I, I still am at it. And that's why I was so pleased when NBC4 agreed to publish my uh, my metro column once a week and i know now you've got a column out and you're discussing our our erstwhile or our late um, police chief mm -hmm. and uh, what she's doing kathy lanier well w one of the last things she did her parting shot if you will after she announced that she was going to retire for uh, after 10 years she comes out and she says by the way btw <laughs> Uh, the criminal justice system in Washington, D.C. is is broken beyond repair. And, you know, a lot of people said, well, you know, thanks for telling us now. Where she been? Where you been? And, you know, her complaint was we arrest people over and over and over again. We're arresting the same people and they're out on the street the next day. And that's something that I have been writing about for years and heartily agree with. So my column this week for, uh, for uh, NBC4 NBC was... Hey, you know, violent criminals stalk the streets and and disrupt our communities because the criminal justice system system will not will not uh, identify them uh, or, uh, and lock them up for a long time. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to be warehoused. I think that that uh, if you're arrested and jailed for a drug offense, that's silly. You should be treated. Absolutely. But if you're running around with a gun shooting people, bye bye. Put them away. That's what I think. Well, you know, it didn't start with Kathy Lanier. This has been going. I've heard this story, oh, for uh, 30 years at least. Yeah, so it's, a, maybe it's about 40. time to fix it. There's, there's something in our criminal justice system that doesn't keep these people locked up. Right. And it's the same people time after time after time. Everybody knows that. So was, how about if we fix it? Harry, there was the same system at one time about drunk drivers. It was looked upon as, as a social Thing. Right, and they look the other way. Right now, they've gotten tough on that. Right, and it's really helped. They should get tough on gun, gun crimes as well. Absolutely, we'd all gun be crimes. we'd all be safer. Harry, you're so right. Well, we look forward to that. Now we can get your column. We meaning the public can get your column. NBC Four. NBC Four under, a website, the digital. Yeah, under under Harry Jaffe, of course. Now, saying about our town, that I've known it as well as I know my hand. Where in the world is Borderstown? Ah, uh, Borderstown. Yeah, well, Borderstan, hey, Afghanistan, you, you know, uh, Borderstan. Borderstan is a is the uh, the small community between Dupont Circle and Logan Circle, Harry. and they call it Borderstan because it is literally on the border between those two neighborhoods. And there was a blog, very popular blog called Borderstan, which described what was going on there. Harry, that blows my mind. Now, I guess the young people know about it. Uh, Brendan Martin was just says he knows where it is. You know, I've spent all my waking life here. Well, it's a joke. I've never heard it's, of it. it's a joke. It is. That's a because it really, it really doesn't have a name, so they gave it a name. Well, a lot of people and that's where I live. And that's where names, I live. And that we, it's not on a map, so I couldn't find it. 
But Harry, it's been just great, and we're going to continue. I want to find out from you some more things, and particularly what your plans are for the future. Because uh, the future is now, uh, Harry. This is Andy Ockerzels, and this is Our Town. This is Sonny Jorgensen. Got a confession to make. I let my wife drag me to one of those Mike Collins estate planning seminars. Like I don't have enough on my plate with a certain football team. Actually, it wasn't too bad. In fact, we both learned a whole lot about how to protect our kids and grandkids down the road and to take care of ourselves right now. So if you get one of Mike's invitations in the mail, go. I'm glad I did. Get all the information and register online at MikeCollins.com. That's MikeCollins.com. You're listening to Our Town with Andy Ockershausen. Brought to you by Best Bark Communications. Harry Jaffe, who's become a very, very good friend of mine, uh, took on a project, and when he started talking about it to me, I couldn't believe it because I didn't know who, who this guy he's covering. His name was Bernie Sanders, a senator from Vermont, and the rest is history. Right. Right, and Harry, I, uh, you did it. I was I was uh, recall very vividly being a reporter at the Rutland Herald in 1974, five and six, and occasionally I'd look up on the TV and there would be uh, at a at a political debate, there'd be an upstanding uh, you know guy Republican running for governor and an upstanding Democrat running for governor, and then there'd be this guy with curly hair, big thick glasses, sweating bullets, talking about uh, socialism and and you know uh, imperialism to Vermont and. And That's forty years ago, yeah, and I and everybody thought he was a joke, and then he he uh, he becomes uh, mayor of Burlington, and then was he a council huge too, success. or did he go right to mayor? Right to mayor, and then right to Congress, and then right to the Senate. And now he's a brand. I mean, there are two brands in Vermont: Ben and Jerry's, <laughs> and, and Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Sanders. Now, the, the um, capital city of Vermont is Montpelier, Montpelier right. correct? You never worked in the capital city, but you still con- you still covered the politicians. Well, no, I would occasionally go to Montpelier. Would you? From yeah, Rutland? Cover, and cover the uh, the legislature. Now, did, was he a council person, or did you go right to mayor? He he surprised himself when he wa- when he became mayor, uh, because he ran as an independent. Uh, he ran against an entrenched Democratic machine. And uh, he won because he put together this coalition of senior citizens and disenfranchised working people and the cops who hadn't gotten a raise for years. And, How about uh, college students? And, and Absolutely college students at UVM. The young people really went for a right. new so, idea. So he won and, and he, was, he was in shock because he'd never run anything in his life. I mean, Bernie Sanders never had a job, <laughs> right? And he never made any money. Never made any money. Um, and and so, uh, but he loved it. Once he became mayor, he took to it, and he, he did good have things. He was an effective mayor. He was a very good mayor. Um, and you know, Burlington, Vermont is. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's on Lake Champlain. It's a beautiful town, and uh, he he made it better for people who were disenfranchised. So he kind of walked the walk, and uh, and uh, he was able to get a statewide brand in part because there is one. TV station in the state of Vermont out of Burlington. So people in Rutland and, you know, Bennington and, you know, and White River Junction kept seeing his mug on the TV. And so he had a statewide following after a while. Right. And that led him then, he continued to be an independent. Mm -hmm. He never ran as a Democrat or Republican. Hates the Democrats. But he he was, was sort of in Congress, but not very effective, correct? Absolutely, because he he didn't play with anybody, and, right. and he didn't you play have any game. you have to make coalitions in Congress. Right, and Bernie is you know I, I'm running this show. Are you on my team? You're not on my team. Go away. And uh, and he was very doctrinaire. He is a socialist. Make no mistake about it. Oh yeah. And uh, people didn't measure up. And if they didn't measure up to his standards, then he wasn't interested in dealing with them. And that was most people in Congress. Oh, absolutely. He couldn't find any kindred. Yeah, there's most, well, most people in the Senate as well. Except like he's not very well liked on Capitol Hill. There's another independent from was it uh, from uh, where from Michigan. Um, Oh, his brother's in the Senate, and he's a congressman. Isn't he an independent? Levin? Uh, no, no. Uh, Carl? Uh, no. Carl, right. I thought he yeah. was an independent. Carl Levin. But Bernie yeah. stuck it out there the whole time as an independent. He never hid from that. No, and that's because he comes from a state, a small state, that values 
you know, the rugged individualism and it doesn't is not really wed to, to parties. It's, a, it's almost like the frontier. It you is. Know, but his background is New York, right? He's Brooklyn. Came from Brooklyn, came from, uh, a, you know, a, a Jewish community in uh, a little Jewish ghetto. Bensonhurst. Well, it was it was actually, uh, you know, uh, not uh, it was uh, what's it called? It wasn't ben Bensonhurst, but it was nearby there. Um, and he went to James Madison High School where Chuck Schumer went. Uh, where Ruth Bader Ginsburg went, um, and a lot of uh, you know pretty pretty successful right people. people, yeah, and that's where he got his education. Well, and then his career in the Senate took off, enabled him to get a foothold some way. How he did that is amazing. I, I think that he Trump may be a phenomenon, but he was really a phenomenon. I, I, th I think that he and Trump uh, hit a a, a nerve. In this country, at the same time, of people who were disenfranchised, people who were angry with the parties, and uh, and wanted some serious change. Now, obviously, they came from totally polar opposite points of view. Yes, but because you know Trump's people are very, very conservative, and and Bernie Sanders' people were very young and very progressive. Right. But I think that um, that my my prediction is that the Trump is going to go away right. and he'll become, uh, a, once again, a businessman with a brand. I think that Bernie Sanders is going to continue to make a progressive party, try to create a, uh, a movement, a movement right. that he believes in. Uh, and I think that whether he, he, he might actually be effective, who knows? Well, he certainly got the young people, which is the future. But isn't it kind of odd that this old Jewish guy from Brooklyn, <laughs> exactly. you know, he's in his mid seventies, has this following uh, of millennials because they think he's cute? I kept asking people, "What? Why?" I mean, he's you know, he talks with a with a Brooklyn accent. He's angry. Right. Uh, he doesn't like you. He, uh, he had great body language. And, he moved and, his arms. And so I would hand. ask, I would ask because my I have two I have daughters who are in their twenties, and I said, "What do you see in the guy?" And they'd say, "He's cute." I'd say, "What?" <laughs> He's a cute campaigner. I guess. Harry, you did a did a great job. From have you had any any action from Bernie about your book? No, Bernie ignored me uh, from the beginning, and <laughs> he probably remembers you from Vermont. No, but, but the thing is, that what what people don't realize is ignoring a journalist is a bad idea, <laughs> because you know we're going to do what we're going to do absolutely, regardless. And and if if a if I have a book contract to write about Bernie Sanders or anybody else, and they say we're not dealing with you, that is freedom for me absolutely That's license for way. me i can talk to whomever i want it. and i can say i tried to talk to this person and they didn't want to so here you go well well someday in your great writing career i would prevail upon you to consider writing a book about don busco cristo ray school that you've been so always possible beneficial to us always possible and you know how much that school means to us absolutely and what it means to the community and what good work it's doing and you're a writer that found that out yeah. it's great work, and it continues harry no question about it come you know these kids couldn't go anywhere now you, we've done you, it you bring me in there anytime and i'll write about you're the best harry jaffe the brilliant author of the book about Bernie Sanders. He's and coming next brilliant week. writer. And, <laughs> Harry, and the Channel 4. Now he's in television, guys. Look out. <laughs> Harry, thank you very much. This has been Our Town, Andy Ocker's housing with Harry Jaffe. And we look forward to hearing more from you, Harry. You're never going to stop hearing from You're me. You're the best, babe. Thank you. You've been listening to Our Town Season 1 with your host, Andy Ockershausen. New Our Town podcast episodes are released each Tuesday and Thursday. We welcome your comments and suggestions on how you like the show or who you'd like to hear from next. Catch us on Facebook at Our Town DC or visit our website at OurTownDC.com. Our special thanks to WMAL Radio in Washington, D.C. for hosting our podcasts.